Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Lisa Alexander, and I want to welcome everyone to our panel on affirmative action, where we've been and where we're going. Um, I'm a new professor here at Boston College Law School, uh, but I've been a law professor for 16 years. I teach uh, corporations, housing law and policy, and local government law. And I'm also a member of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Faculty Committee at BC Law. And it's in that capacity that I want to welcome you to today's panel and introduce our moderator. Um, I also want to thank the Rappaport Center and particularly uh, Lizzie Medvedo for her tireless efforts to bring this program to fruition. Um, consistent with the Rappaport Center's mission, this program and its co-sponsors wanted to develop a program that would explore diverse perspectives on affirmative action, uh, discuss what the law of affirmative action has been, what it is, what it might be after the Supreme Court's upcoming decision, and most importantly, to reflect on what it should be. And there's no person better suited to these tasks than our moderator for today's panel, Professor Ted M. Shaw. Um, Theodore Shaw is the Julius L. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Law and the Director of the UNC Center for Civil Rights. He teaches courses in civil procedure and advanced constitutional law, the 14th Amendment, affirmative action, and many other areas in the broad category of civil rights. Uh, among his scores of honors are the 2012 Harlem Neighborhood Defenders Office Hayward Burns Humanitarian Award, um, the Office of Appellate Defender Award for Outstanding Advocacy, um, he's published many books and chapters and has really long been a drum major for justice. Um, Professor Shaw attended Columbia University's law school as a Charles Evans Hughes fellow. Um, and he also attended Wesleyan University, which are two of my alma maters as well. Um, he then practiced as a trial attorney in the honors program of the US Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. He joined the staff of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where he worked for 26 years and eventually was a uh, director uh, counsel there for many years. Um, he uh, previously taught at the University of Michigan Law School, where he played a key role in initiating a review of its admissions policy that was upheld by the Supreme Court in Grutter v. Bollinger. He's taught at Columbia University School of Law, CUNY School of Law, Queens College and Temple Law School. And he's currently the head of the UNC Center, which was um, originally started by his mentor, um, Julius Chambers. Ted has also been a long time my boss, a longtime mentor of mine, and a friend. And so I'm thrilled to introduce him, and I'm thrilled that he's our moderator for today's session. So without further ado, Ted Shaw. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm glad to see you, uh, even if it's only by Zoom, and hope that uh, I get to see you in person sometime. Um, and I also want to welcome everyone here. My job is to uh, introduce the panelists and then play traffic cop. And the introduction, uh, my introduction is going to be pretty brief because um, uh, what we want to do is get the discussion going and the presentation and discussions. And so uh, as our panelists today, uh, I want to introduce uh, David uh, Hinojosa, uh, who is at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law. Um, he is uh, a leading litigator, uh, especially when it comes to civil rights issues. Um, and he spearheads the Lawyers Committee's um, its, uh, racial justice work. Um, he uh, is the lead counsel uh, for interveners in the UNC uh, case involving uh, the uh, attack on diversity at Harvard University and then at UNC, but he's uh, uh, the intervener's lawyer in the UNC case. Uh, uh, but he's worked on many other uh, uh, important cases, and I won't uh, detail them here. He has a a particular, uh, uh, particularly strong presence uh, 
uh, in cases involving North Carolina, my state. So always good to be with you, um, David. I should mention that he did argue uh, in the Supreme Court uh, in the UNC case uh, brought by, by students for fair admissions. Um, uh, I want to introduce, and Marjorie, um, I don't want to in any way butcher your pronunciation of your name. I guess you get this from other people, but I don't want to mess it up. Um, uh, Marjorie, uh, would you pronounce your name so I don't get an opportunity to mess it up? Of course, Marjorie Salvador. Okay, well, thank you. And um, glad to have you here. Um, Marjorie teaches uh, history, language, global culture um, at uh, Suffolk University, um, uh, has done work on cultural studies, film, women and gender studies, um, and uh, is a graduate of Holyoke, Mount Holyoke College and Brown University. Um, and I guess uh, you're about to become the Associate Dean of Experiential Learning, um, Global Education and Social Impact uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences at Suffolk. And I wanna congratulate you on that new role and responsibility. Um, Patrick Strawbridge uh, is a partner at Consovoy McCarthy. And um, for those of us who are engaged in uh, work involving uh, diversity, affirmative action, issues of race, um, Patrick doesn't need an introduction, even though he gets one. Um, he is um, uh, a, um, a lawyer who has represented on all levels uh, you know, plaintiffs who have been um, uh, suing to challenge uh, diversity slash affirmative action efforts in higher education. He has uh, roots in Maine. Uh, he's clerked for uh, Justice Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court level. Uh, Judge uh, Morris Arnold on the Eighth Circuit. Patrick, I can't resist. I used to spend a lot of time in the Eighth Circuit. And, uh, there are two Judge Arnolds at the time that I uh, appeared before. Um, uh, and also Justice Howard Dana of, of the Supreme Court of Maine. Um, so, uh, you know, Patrick is also an adjunct professor uh, for the Supreme Court Clinic at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University um, uh, and graduated from the University of Missouri with a bachelor's in journalism and then JD from Creighton School of Law uh, admitted to practice in Maine and in Massachusetts. I've told Patrick this before, my family and I came to love Maine and um, uh, hope to get back there as soon as we can sometime. So those are our, um, uh, those are our panelists. I have a, a question that I want to ask to kick us off. And um, Patrick, if you don't mind me starting with you uh, before moving on. Uh, the term affirmative action is back in play now. I say that because for many years, uh, yeah, you heard about affirmative action um, uh, in political and social discourse, uh, but in terms of uh, the jurisprudence, there had been a, a, a significant shift away from affirmative action to issues of diversity. Um, and is my question, is there a difference? Uh, does it matter which one of those terms uh, we use? And if I'm correct, that there is a shift and um, people are talking more about affirmative action again, what difference does it make? Uh, well, thank you for the introduction, Ted, and thank you to BC for allowing us all to be here. 
Um, I can certainly provide, you know, a couple of thoughts on that question. I certainly don't claim to speak for all those who use those terms or, or, or to have the, the only understanding of those terms. Um, I think there's, I think there's, there, there's two things at play. A affirmative action um, has been used to describe a lot of different strategies or a lot of different approaches to achieving uh, racial diversity or other types of diversity over time. And some people, when they hear affirmative action, may think of, you know, efforts to expand an applicant pool or their advertising or a push to make sure that people know that positions are available for them, uh, you know, to apply for. Um, and then affirmative action can also be used for you know, the express consideration of race and governmental decision making, either as a part or even uh, presumably at some point affirmative action would have even swept in programs that were essentially strict quotas based on race. So I think affirmative action has, in, at least in, in legal discourse, sometimes been only used as a shorthand and fallen out of favor because there's a precision question as to how precise and what exactly are we talking about. Now, with respect to efforts at diversity, I think that's kind of the result of what the court said in Grutter when it sort of famously, you know, tried to set at rest the, the, the competing opinions and the somewhat indeterminate decision in Baki as to when is race acceptable, at least in the higher education admissions context. Uh, and the rationale that the court settled on was, was to achieve a critical mass of students of different backgrounds so it could achieve a compelling interest in obtaining diverse viewpoints. And so diversity sort of became the shorthand. There's an interesting question, and we could get into it today or not, um, about whether or not diversity is actually the rationale that most proponents of, you know, race-based or racial preferences in admissions um, think is the strongest rationale or the right rationale. But since Grutter, at least, it has been the only rationale that the Supreme Court has offered up as a legitimate basis by which one could use race as part of a holistic decision-making process. So, you know, I which term has current as current purchase, I'm not sure. And obviously, the, the landscape of the SFFA decisions will have more to say about whether the diversity rationale survives, at least in the higher education context. But I think that's part of what explains uh, uh, why diversity has been the, the, the phrase that was used to describe you know, all sorts of uh, practices, including uh, racial preferences in admissions. Uh, David. Uh, do you want to weigh on uh, in on this? Yeah, I think you know, definitely, you know, with broad strokes, you know, Patrick has you know captured you know the essence of you know the debate or the relationship you know between these two. I do want to note that you know the affirmative action that many, especially of the younger folks that might be on the call here today watching, uh, affirmative action of your parents and grandparents is a lot different than the affirmative action of today. Certainly affirmative action can take many different uh, paths forward. And if you have an intentional discrimination case and you've proven it and you're able to affirmatively act, that might look a lot differently than if you're simply in the higher education context trying to acquire the educational benefits of diversity and no other path forward is allowing you, that, that's a race neutral path forward is not allowing you to acquire those benefits. But, you know, gone are, you know, quotas and bonus points and separate admissions tracks. You know, those are typically what people think of uh, when they think of, when they hear the term affirmative action. So I think kind of, it sort of disappeared uh, and it still disappears depending on what region of the country you're in, you know, so affirmative action might ring a little bit more positive in, on the west and east coast, but you know, in between, it might not be so inviting. But I do think the end goal, and and so what we have today are more along what is known as you know race conscious admissions programs, which again is a part of greater affirmative action, but it's where race is only considered as one factor among several. So there's no automatic bonus points. There's no direct quotas. You know for any uh, racial group, it's not the necessarily the preference that has been used because it's just uh, considered on an individualized basis among all the other factors. And the reason for that is because I think the end goal is certainly in higher education and in these cases present before the court, the end goal is to acquire the educational benefits of diversity, those tremendous 
benefits that allow students to interact and share perspectives uh, where they don't feel like ice, uh, spokespeople for their race or isolated in the classroom, where they're able to build and thrive, you know, with cross-racial understanding. So, you know, the way that I see diversity, and again, like what Patrick said earlier, there's lots of different opinions, you know, on this, but I see that as kind of the end game of affirmative action in higher education that's been recognized by the courts. Uh, Marjorie, you have a few words you want to um, say. Sure. About that. And, yes, I, yes. and I'm not a lawyer, so I will, I will not speak in legal terms, but um, as someone who pays a lot of attention to, to language, I think for me, um, when I think of those two terms, I think about nuances of meaning and also their historical place, right? They each, and I think that the two previous um, speakers spoke to that um, uh, from the legal perspective that they, you know, those terms have been used at specific moments in history, um, in time, um, in this country. I mean, you know, I think for me, I, I sort of don't care so much about the words, um, any of them, but I do care about what those words are really reaching for. And I think um, for me, they're reaching for a sort of redress. They're, they're reaching for um, a, a, you know, a certain way to grapple with what we've inherited, right? And um, to speak specifically to this to this country. Um, and so you know, I think of them as sort of synonymous, not exactly, but I situate them more sort of historically when I hear those terms. Um, and I'm someone who graduated from college in 1989. So what it meant in 1989 is different um, uh, um, uh, than how the word, for example, diversity is being used now. Um, and of course, in, in a very legal way, the term affirmative action. Um, but I, I think for me, what's most interesting um, is um, obviously the different historical moments where these words have basically come to life, right, and come into our usage. But um, I'm focused on, so, you know, why come up with these words, these terms, right, whether it's three decades ago or, or now, and why does it matter for um, thinking about our society and thinking about all segments of our society? Um, you know, not because we're necessarily good people, um, but because if we're going to have a society where we say, right, we have these wonderful values and principles that I'm sure there are people on this call and in the audience who know them better than I do, but um, we talk in these very positive values, but, you know, I'd love us to try to live some of those values and some of the terminology that we use when we do try to reach for, you know, affirmative action or diversity or inclusion. Um, what is the action behind all of those words? I think that's that's all I'll say. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, look, I'm I'm the old head on this panel, uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I <clears throat> I was supposed to uh, give some comments about my perspective, background, and experience, but I jumped right into asking you all about uh, the terminology of uh, affirmative action and diversity. Uh, but let me use this as an opportunity um, before turning back to you all again to say that, uh, you know, this effort, uh, the conscious effort uh, to admit black and brown people, people from groups that had been uh, historically uh, excluded from higher educational opportunity began in the 1960s. Um, and it began as an, an affirmative action imperative. Um, I dare say, but I welcome any challenge on this, anybody wants to uh, bring on this, uh, that if we were able to go back in time to the 1960s, some of us uh, were actually alive and, and uh, our brains were working then. Uh, there was no discourse about diversity. Diversity didn't enter the discourse until the Supreme Court's decision in the Bakke case uh, in 1978. Um, I could say a lot about that. 
a lot of ink has been spilled uh, on this subject, but the bottom line being that uh, that was the first case in which the Supreme Court uh, took on the question of whether or not colleges and universities could consciously consider race and admissions. There was a, an earlier case that went to the Supreme Court as uh, uh, most of us know uh, that uh, uh, was poised to be decided, but then uh, the Supreme Court decided it was moot and ducted. That was in 1974. And then in 78 comes Baki. Uh, Baki said a lot of things. And uh, although most people don't think of it this way, uh, I have often said, and I continue to say, uh, that contrary to what most people hold, Baki for African Americans in particular was a loss in many significant ways. Um, and it was a loss because uh, of the standards that were developed. It was a loss because of the introduction of the notion of societal discrimination that nobody could do anything about. Uh, uh, it was a loss uh, because there was no distinction drawn uh, between uh, what was called at the time, uh, uh, you know, benign discrimination, that is discrimination that was not rooted in notions of uh, racial hostility and inferiority and superiority, uh, but it was just race conscious. Uh, that was not distinguished from what's called invidious discrimination rooted in uh, beliefs and superiority, inferiority and uh, racial discrimination, et cetera. And I can go on and on and talk about Baki and what was decided, but then along comes Justice Powell's uh, opinion, which introduces diversity into um, the discourse and uh, it allows colleges and universities to consider race um, in, in pursuit of diversity and admissions as one factor among many. Uh, so it kind of, uh, uh, for at least those who support uh, conscious efforts to uh, admit students from groups that have been discriminated against and excluded, it kind of brings a, um, uh, a, um, it snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, 25 years passed. Uh, conservatives never uh, accept the Baki case and had been uh, bent on getting it overturned. Uh, sounds like another case that you all can probably bring to mind. Um, and here we are. Uh, after uh, half a century, almost half a century, um, and these two cases involving Harvard and UNC are up in the Supreme Court, uh, and finally, uh, it's the court that conservatives have wanted for so long. Uh, and most people are thinking uh, that they know what the outcome is likely to be. Um, uh, and I'll just add one more thing before turning it back to the panelists. Um, uh, I was a law student uh, in 1978. I was a rising third year law student and I was on the National Board of Balsa. Uh, that academic year that had preceded the decision. Uh, and I was at the Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court, when Baki was decided. Uh, and it's been uh, a big part of my life, uh, this struggle ever since it was decided and continues to be. So I was deeply involved in the Michigan case in particular in ways that uh, I won't bother to go into, but uh, have been involved in many of the other cases also. Um, so I turn this back to uh, to you all, and uh, I ask the question, what do you see at stake now? Um, and what do you see, if you want to prognosticate, uh, about 
uh, the likely outcome and the effects of uh, these two cases in the Supreme Court harbored, by the way, as everybody knows, the first time that a case involving a private uh, institution of higher education is up in the Supreme Court, um, Title VI, et cetera. So uh, uh, let me uh, ask um, and start with you, Marjorie, just reverse the order that we went in before and ask you, what do you think is at stake? What do you think is the likely outcome? Where do you think we're going? Well, I've taught, I've taught full time in a few universities um, in my career. And I think, so I speak then from a, a professor who teaches, um, you know, hundreds of students and who have, who has taught hundreds of students in my career. And I think, you know, one of the biggest losses is the diversity. Um, and I mean that in the fullness of the term um, of experiences of thought, um, of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, of perspectives on the, the campus community. Um, I, you know, I've done a little reading of, of these cases and I, you know, one thing I think about, I think, well, you know, race, race is not, um, well, the argument on the other side, right, is, is that race is being used um, as the as a sole metric or as a singular metric um, to admit certain people. And yet, I, first of all, that seems to me to be a false proposition, a false, a false claim, um, because we all know, I mean, I've never worked in admissions, but I've been long enough in the university system to know that, you know, um, uh, the, the students who are talented athletes, um, the students, if you're on the East Coast, where most of all of my teaching has happened, you know, students who come from the West um, are also considered in a different way, right? So, so diversity has been used um, to think about all kinds of diversity um, and, and not just in terms of race. And I think sometimes we get lost in that. And, you know, and as a black person um, living in this society, you know, so, so people sort of look at us um, and, and they're really including black, brown, um, indigenous, um, Asian, right? They sort of look at us like, yeah, you are taking spots away, right? Um, from the non-black, the non-Asian, right? The non um uh, people of color or people of the global majority, which is what I like to use, because we, in fact, we are the global majority. Um, we're not minorities. But, you know, I, I think, um, how do we, how do we begin to redress that if we, if we can't consider the full diversity of human beings? Um, and I, I think it's going to be disastrous for not only who sits in the classrooms, but who gets to teach? Um, who gets to be studied? Um, um, you know, wh what do people, what do students study? Um, I, so I think it affects the whole, whole range of work that we do in, in the university classroom. And I'm not just talking about representational, right? You know, like, oh, okay, we have 30%, you know, um, students. And, and, I, and I also want to say as someone, as a proud graduate of a, of a seven sister of a women's college, you know, women were also considered not fit. Um, my daughter attends one school in Boston that was, you know, created because because the women in the early um, part of this, the creation of this state, um, you know, we're not allowed to be educated with boys. So, you know, I think we also need to think about women, although with women, um, we have made advances um, and white women, right, have made advances in, in, in certain fields, um, but still are a minority in others. So I, so I think, I think I really think it's going to be a lack. I think it's there's going to be an absence. And I think it does influence the quality of our thinking, the quality of our work, and how we imagine the world. And I'll just say one thing to finish. You know, one of the reasons why I love global majority, that term to talk about people of color, is that it instead of looking at US society and thinking, okay, you know, white people are this and black people are doing this and Latinx and right. Um the, we need to think in terms of the world, right? We are one country among many, many countries. And so I'll, I'll end there. 
Okay, well, thank you. And, and um, uh, David, I want you to, um, to, uh, to hold on for a minute. Uh, if I were uh, Patrick right now, uh, which I'm not, uh, my head would be about to explode. Uh, Patrick, you and your colleagues represent the plaintiffs in these lawsuits. You have a, uh, a set of claims and arguments that uh, you are making, have been making, and you came in part to this, I presume, um, to talk about why you all um, are pursuing these claims. Um, uh, what, um, what are these cases about in your view? Uh, I know what they're about in your view, but um, what I want you to share with everyone, um, you know, what are you all doing and why? <laughs> Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss a little bit about the basics of, of, of what these cases are seeking to achieve and what I think, or where I agree or where I disagree with some of the other panelists in, in the interpretation of some of the things that are at stake. So these cases were brought by Students for Fair Admissions, which is a nonprofit organization. It has more than 20,000 members uh, across the United States who share one common goal, and that is to eliminate race as a factor in college admissions. Uh, this is not I think a revolutionary idea, um, the idea that, that especially governmental use of race when we talk about state schools, but as, as uh, Professor Shaw mentioned, uh, Title VI imposes the same obligations, or at least it's been interpreted to impose the same obligations on private schools like Harvard College. Um, uh, these, these provisions have long been viewed as restricting the use of race, um, and Bakke was obviously the one exception that Crutter kind of fleshed out in the higher education context, but I think as, as many people probably realize, uh, survey after survey indicates that the use of race as a factor, even a minor factor in college admissions, remains highly unpopular with the American public and indeed is viewed disfavorably by a majority of of Americans and indeed a majority of every ethnic group that is polled on this question. So I don't think that that's a particularly revolutionary concern and it arises from I think a fundamental point of agreement or what has long been a point of agreement in American law, which is that race is a dangerous feature with which one to play and it is a dangerous feature to entrust to bureaucracies or the government or, uh, or any entity that is exercising power. And although we may think that we can distinguish between the good type of racial categorizations and the bad type of racial categorizations. History has shown that that tends not to be borne out. Korematsu is perhaps maybe the most obvious example of people who thought that they had come up with a good reason or an important reason to justify discriminating on the base of race. And that I think we all now correctly, or, 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 or most people would view that as a, as, a, as a tragically mistaken decision that imposed a lot of harm. So race based criteria uh, is always been viewed, I think properly so with skepticism in a country that obviously went to war over, uh, over its treatment of particular racial groups. Um, with respect to what we're seeking, the question is, is not whether or not there should be diversity. I don't think that, they, that the cases can be fairly characterized as an attack on diversity, certainly not an attack on diversity writ large, because one of the claims in the case that was advanced at both schools was that you can obtain equal amounts of diversity with respect to ethnic diversity, but also other types of diversity, most importantly, socioeconomic diversity through race neutral means. Uh, there was a lot of expert testimony that indicated that. Um, and I think that it remains true that our colleges are stratified too much by socioeconomic status um, and that eliminating race as a criteria in the admissions decision making is very likely to encourage and promote greater socioeconomic diversity on our, on our campuses. I think most people, uh, surveys also show favor socioeconomic diversity. They would like to view colleges as an opportunity to allow more people access to higher education who have been deprived of that. And socioeconomic status is, is highly correlated with the lack of opportunity to obtain higher education. So I, I don't think it's true that the elimination of race as a factor in college admissions is necessarily going to reduce or eliminate uh, racial diversity or other types of diversity on college campuses. Certainly that has been the experience at some of the states that have eliminated the use of race. They have still managed to maintain levels of diversity. Um, the California uh, higher educational system, for example, is less white today than it was you know, 20 years ago when, when uh, Proposition uh, 
is it 187 uh, or 189, I can't remember the number, um, was passed to ban the use of racial preferences in those jurisdictions. There are a number of uh, states today, uh, Oklahoma is among them, uh, the, the higher education systems in Florida and to some extent Georgia also do not use race as an admissions factor. And we do not think that those states have failed to obtain uh, real educational, real diversity and real educational benefits at their campuses. Um, I'll just address one more thing before I turn it back over. I, I don't want to hog too much time here. But when we talk about whether race or race alone is used, I don't think anyone doubts that that the admission systems that exist today are in fact holistic. They don't only sort on the basis of race. Race is not the only criteria that is used to decide where, other, where anyone gets in. But the colleges defended these cases on the grounds that race is an important criteria to them. At least it's an important enough criteria that they were unwilling to forego it. Uh, by necessity, when you have a holistic admissions process and you use one criteria in that, that means that for some number of students in any given year, that criteria will be the one that elevates them from the discard pile into the accept pile. Um, and indeed, both of the colleges, I don't, I don't think contested that there was some number of cases in which race would make a decision. I think they had to uh, agree with that proposition because otherwise I don't think they could survive strict scrutiny. If race was never actually making a decision in anyone's admission, then there would be no justification to continue using it under the, 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 the strict scrutiny tier that we apply to race-based decision-making. So that's just some thoughts, and I'm sure that there's gonna be some vigorous disagreement and, and happy to return to them, but uh, thanks, Ted, for giving me the chance to, to share some of those views. Well, you're welcome, Patrick, and you're right. There'll be vigorous uh, disagreement, and um, uh, David, have at it. So we do represent a multiracial group of student interveners in the UNC case, and we did, uh, they were, the, the only students who testified in this case, uh, in the UNC case, were those student interveners and alumni who testified in the case. Um, and I say that because these cases are really about the students. You know, we talk about this in terms of universities and, you know, the educational benefits of diversity that help them achieve their missions. And that's incredibly important, right? You know, because the 14th Amendment here, as the court has held, isn't seen in isolation of a university's own First Amendment interest in recruiting a student body that it believes will help achieve its um, missions and goals, which may be uh, inclusive of racial diversity and its attending benefits. But, you know, these students also intervene because they understand you know, as much as, you know, one might want to discount the educational benefits of diversity, there's substantial testimony in this case, as well as in Harvard, where we also represented uh, a multiracial group of Asian American, Latinx, and Black students as amici in that case, but we did present um, students uh, who testified in that case, and all the students testified about, it. one, how important it is to reflect upon their race and their applications, you know, that if they were to censor, have their race censored out of their applications, it would just take out a lot of the value in their applications. And that is one thing that SFFA has asked the court to do. It doesn't want to tell you, you know, directly, you didn't hear any of that right now in uh, Patrick's presentation of this case, but it's not just about the elimination of race as a plus factor. Uh, in admissions, but they also think that admissions officers should be censored, and it's part of their direct relief. And they've gone back and forth on this issue in the presentation of the case, sometimes telling the courts, well, you know, we're not really doing this, but, um, but they haven't, you know, th they never amended their complaint, you know, to take out that form of relief. At times, they've said, well, yes, you can uh, reflect on racialized uh, admissions or, or racialized experiences uh, for students, uh, and then other times, including during oral argument, when Justice Jackson brought a very pointed hypothetical to SFFA's counsel, inquiring um, if there was a fifth generation legacy student, so a fifth generation white student who was, um, who wrote about you know, being proud of that in their 
application in their narrative, um, you know, could the university consider that and contrasted it with a fifth generation descendant of slaves. For those of you who don't know, UNC was founded in 1789. It's the oldest public university in the country as a university to help educate the children of slave owners. It operated for over 150 years in that kind of environment, excluding uh, Black students, excluding Native American students as well, uh, all the way through Brown v. Board. But even 30 years after that, after Brown v. Board, they continued to fight integration at its campuses. And that is part of the record in this case. And the reason why I mention that is because it's incredibly important when you think about that history and the present day effects that still occur on campus. So when students uh, that we represented and testified very strongly about the way that walking on a campus with uh, Confederate statutes and buildings named after white supremacists, and that's not you know stretching the term, they were white supremacists, you know, uh, back in the day, about how that makes them feel and whether or not that makes them want to open up on campus. But also, it impacts the recruitment and retention of students at a university like UNC. So we can talk about whether or not the elimination of race, the consideration of race, um, what that means. But the fact is, is that SFFA is not just stopping there. Not, they're not just saying, well, the, um, the, the, the consideration of race violates strict scrutiny. It's inconsistent with strict scrutiny and it should be thrown out. But there's other implications for that ruling. And so we don't know the outcome. I believe I'm one of the few that will say this, but I believe that we will win uh, if the court is allegiant to the letter of law, the constitution, precedent, and the incredible record developed in these cases, then we win. Affirmative action is upheld in, um, in higher education. But you know the notion, and, and I'll just say one, one last thing. There is a record in both of these cases the race neutral alternatives that Mr. Strawbridge had uh, referred to, you know, using income, you know, socioeconomic status as opposed to race, that actually doesn't lead to greater diversity. There were several dozen, over a hundred actually, uh, models run between, you know, both cases, and none of them showed that they would still uh, get the diversity that falls in line with the university's overall academic mission. And the fact is, is because in America, white students make up the vast majority of poor students in America still. So there's more white poor students because there's so many more white students in America than there are black students. So there's higher proportions perhaps of um, low income students among Black and Latinx uh, racial and ethnic groups, but overall, you know, you, by converting socioeconomic status to race, not only do you turn off the incredible experiences potentially of someone's own racial background, but you also end up decreasing racial diversity. You know, the preferred plan in the Harvard case showed that there would be a 45% drop in the black student population. SFFA is fine with that. You know, they say they're not against diversity, but all of their models, you know, would end up uh, decreasing diversity or decreasing the academic potential at the university. So I think that that's um, troubling. And what we do know, the, the record is actually a little different than what Patrick said on diversity at California, Michigan and Oklahoma. What we do know is that at the more selective universities like UC Berkeley, UCLA, they have barely 
caught up in some instances, but in other instances, they're still further behind than they were 25, 30 years ago when affirmative action was banned. So whenever you ban affirmative action, racial diversity plummets in underrepresented groups. The same thing happened and is happening at the University of Oklahoma at Norman, you know, the state's flagship. So he's talking about the demographics across Oklahoma, but when you look at the flagships, when you look at graduate programs, when you look at University of Michigan, their Blacks undergrad student enrollment was 7% in 2006, 4% in 2021, despite an increase of African-American, uh, in the college-aged African-American population in Michigan from 16% to 19%. So you have the denominator increasing, but the numerator decreasing. And that's happened consistently all across. So I want to, um, and uh, Marjorie, if you can hold on a minute, I want to throw in a couple of things into the mix. Uh, uh, first, uh, Patrick, um, you pointed to uh, uh, race conscious admissions as being largely unpopular across the um, uh, the country, uh, including all all groups, among all groups. Um, and um, I wanted to um, throw some this into the mix here. Uh, is this solely a matter of popularity? Uh, you know, when uh, we talk about groups that historically have been excluded, uh, and particularly, but not exclusively, African Americans, Black folk. Uh, you know, the only thing that has changed um, the dynamic of exclusion of African Americans uh, in uh, a significant way uh, was affirmative action, uh, then also um, diversity. Uh, but, uh, you know, the whole notion of, of uh, anti-discrimination law, the 14th Amendment, now being used by uh, you and your colleagues on behalf of uh, white students and some uh, Asians and Asian Americans, uh, but not all of them, uh, but the only dynamic that really changed this country was uh, when the 14th Amendment was brought back to life uh, in the aftermath of Brown, but also activism uh, that changed all that. Uh, uh, I want to ask you whether this is, or to rethink whether this is uh, solely a matter of popularity. Uh, because racial discrimination in this country, that long history uh, of racial discrimination um, was supported uh, by popularity in many ways. Um, so I kind of had a, a reaction when you talked about unpopularity, uh, but I also, uh, want to throw out Marty, something that you, uh, I think, alluded to, and I want to be a little bit more specific. There's all kinds of affirmative action in this country. Has been. You know, you know the book, uh, When Affirmative Action Was White. Um, and uh, even today, quietly, unspokenly, uh, and you probably know where I'm going, Patrick. There's a great deal of affirmative action going on for white men in this country. Women are outperforming men academically and are in many instances uh, increasingly more qualified than men. There's a crisis that a lot of people are talking about, uh, which uh, people are trying to understand what's happening with men. So uh, I 
um, I want to suggest there's all kinds of affirmative action, including affirmative action um, for white men going on right now. Nobody seems to holler at this or about it. The one thing that uh, I think, um, you know, I, I think we have to keep in mind is that a lot of what is going on now, with all due respect, uh, whatever respect is due to it, Patrick, is that a lot of what's going on is driven by a continuing antagonism and antipathy toward Black folks in particular, but not only. Um, and uh, a, uh, the rumors of inferiority. Uh, so uh, I wanted to throw that in there in the mix, give Marjorie an opportunity to tell me that that's not what she was thinking or whether you, know, you have some other reaction. Um, uh, and then we'll get back to you, Patrick, and have you um, come back at, uh, at least me, and uh, I assume at David and what he said. Uh, we're at a point now where I want to, in spite of, you know, I took a few minutes just now, uh, I want us to begin to uh, uh, cut our answers down because uh, we're going to get to a, uh, a um, question and answer um, period. And also, uh, you know, I started us out in the conversation, didn't give you an opportunity to, uh, I might have given you an opportunity, Patrick, to some degree. Uh, to make your opening statements, um, but you'll certainly get an opportunity to uh, to say anything that you wanted to say uh, in um, in closing before we go to question and answer. So, uh, is that all right, Marjorie? Let's go. It's 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 on you. It's on me. Okay. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. I've been taking notes like a good student. Um, well, I guess, you know, one question I had after Mr. Um, Strawbridge's intervention, you know, I think that comes to me, you know, why eliminate, why focus on race? Why eliminate race and not something else like regional identity um, or sports? And I do agree that there is a certain anti-blackness um, that I feel is a specter around this move. Um, again, I'm not a legal scholar. My father thought I should be a lawyer because we argued so much when I was a teenager, but I have no legal training. I did take a course at Holyoke on minorities and the law uh, with the wonderful teacher there. But um, so I am not versed in, in the terms that um, you all are using, except that the cases that you do mention, I have studied as an undergraduate and they have been very impactful in my particular life as a black woman in this, in this country. Um, you know, I'm a humanist, so I want to read poetry to you all. <laughs> I, you know, and I have a few poems that I wanted to read today, but I guess, you know, the thing I want to say is that when I think about diversity, affirmative action, I, you know, I don't really care about the word. And like I said in my opening statement, I care about the actions and I care about justice. Um, and there are some great uh, questions, by the way, in the chat. And so I hope we get to some, to answering some of those. But, you know, I think about nature. I really, I love the outdoors. Doors, um, and how nature is such a powerful, it, it reminds us of the powerful web of diversity, of interconnection, um, and of expansiveness, right? So, you know, higher education should not be about limiting. We need to expand. And this country in particular, but I would say the world, you know, needs all hands on deck, right? We need all of us to do what we can, you know, to make this world all that it can be. And sure, it's really, you know, there is such a thing as the systemic injustices um, that so many of us so continue to suffer and have suffered. Um, and, you know, but we also need to go towards the interconnection, the expansiveness. And I have to say, as someone who I will not say with school, um, that that I, I did not get, I was waitlisted at this undergraduate school. I have a lot of empathy as a professor of undergraduate students for, you know, when students want to get into a particular school and don't get in. But part of me is sort of like, you know what, it's called life. We don't, all, and, 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 and where I ended up going turned out to be the place I needed to be. Um, so I'm very happy that it, it 
worked out that way. So I have I have empathy for the students who feel like, you know, I I started a nonprofit. Um, I'm a great track star. I'm this wonderful, you know, high school student. And I have, you know, a five point GPA. Yay, you. Um, but this idea that, you know, the elite schools should only be focused on a certain, um, you know, CV, on a certain ac accomplishments to the detriment of others. Because frankly, I think we all bring something to the table, right? Not all of us can do, you know, really complicated math. Not all of us can write beautiful sentences or poems. Um, but all of us are human and we're all trying to make ourselves right to, to make it through this world and we're and we need to we need to do it together interconnection and expansiveness are the words of the day um, we, we there, there's no like me, me me or my people only that we need each other it's not even a choice it just is um and the poems that I probably won't get to read because I want to get to the the questions in the chat they're great questions but you know I really think it is about that and and for me you know my humanist colors are, are showing here um that's what i go to and I, I i think nature has powerful lessons for us if if we humans would only heed them well thank you um uh uh pat patrick i want to uh come back to you uh but i also want to ask uh you whether you have anything um any thoughts on uh, the push that has been underway recently uh, to move away from US News and World Report rankings? And do you think that somehow is connected? I think this is the question that you, you have uh, in mind also. Uh, do you think that this is connected to these cases in any way? But you may have some other reactions to what we have said yeah I want, let me try to answer a couple of the questions that were raised earlier i'll do this very briefly and then i can touch on that but i i obviously want to be able to engage with q a as well so i will i will yeah. try to be very short and happy to expound upon it as necessary um with respect to your question originally about whether this is a matter of popularity i think it's a matter of pop in, in the legal sense the popularity is not particularly relevant except in one you know, strictly legal fashion, which is when you're overruling precedent, the amount of reliance uh, that an opinion has garnered within public society is one of the factors the court can, can considers in deciding whether to overrule precedent. And so public opinion about a particular uh, case or decision uh, may indeed reflect upon that question. But but no, I, I think I did it only to kind of underscore a larger point, which I don't think that this is necessarily a question of some some small conservatives who are disgruntled about Baki laying in wait for 40 years for their chance. I think this has been a divisive issue and it's been a divisive issue among all aspects of American society. You might be surprised to learn that the members of Students for Fair Admissions do in fact include some Hispanic and some African Americans in addition to Asian Americans as well as white Americans. Doesn't uh, surprise me. And I've been around the block for a long time, but there are a lot of folks in those groups who were opposed to what you were doing also. Uh, uh, and I don't disagree. People have different views on this, except um, I guess another point that I would say is that is that uh, there's certainly a lot of criticisms to be made of elite colleges selection of criteria. I mean, Students for Fair Admissions complaint included an argument that Harvard should get rid of its legacy preferences, for example, and even that UNC should. Uh, but at Harvard, it, it bears a particularly heavy piece of weight. Um, and that's because that was an alternative that they could they could get rid of to uh, advance their interest in achieving other types of diversity, particularly racial diversity, without actually using race as a criteria. And 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 I have my own ideas about what colleges should or shouldn't use, and 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 whether people should want to get into a particular college or not. I'm I'm a you know, graduate of a public land grant university. I'm not the product of an elite law school or of an elite uh, uh, undergrad institution. But at the end of the day, race is treated somewhat differently. It's treated differently by our Constitution. It's treated differently by the 14th Amendment. It's treated differently than the Sixth Amendment, than other criteria. And that's because at the end of the day, I think this is undeniable, your race, anyone's race, is not an accomplishment. It's not the same as having excelled at a particular talent 
or a sport, which takes you know years of practice and dedication, commitment, and the balancing of a lot of factors. There are people who share the same uh, racial identity, but they have come from extremely different positions with respect to their access to opportunity, perhaps their family wealth, even perhaps their history or their legacy of their family uh, in this country. And so the, I think the reason why race is singled out as something that we shouldn't do, just like we don't want it used to assign government benefits, just like we don't want it used to decide who gets a government job, just like we might not want to decide who gets locked up or who gets convicted of a crime, is that race is not a legitimate decision uh, uh, factor in our country. And we've learned that through uh, very difficult times and obviously important treatment of racial groups in our history. The reason why, and I want to come to David, but the reason why race has been such a lightning rod is especially because of the experience with respect to Black folks in this country, the legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow segregation, um, the hundreds and hundreds of years that only began to, uh, to be addressed, um, you know, uh, 60 some odd years ago. If then, that's the reason. So it's a real irony to say that race has, uh, considerations of race, racism has done terrible things in this country and therefore we are highly suspicious of it. So we're not gonna consider it. Uh, and we're especially not gonna consider it when those considerations would go to um, uh, conscious decisions that would open up opportunity for Black folks who have been victimized by this long history. Not only Black folks, but Black folks in a peculiar way. Um, uh, David. So I'll start off with a quote from one of our witnesses who testified in the UNC case, and that's by Ms. Mwamba, who explained, it's really important, at least for my application, that UNC see who I am holistically and how the color of my skin and the texture of my hair impacted my upbringing. Much of the complaints, at least as far as the way that we read SFFA's complaint, is to try and strip out race from all facets of a student's own application, their qualities and their strengths that they bring to the classroom, to the overall campus. And when we think about race conscious admissions, where again, race is not being used mechanically, there was a huge, there were a three week trial in Harvard, a two week trial in UNC, and the courts weighed that evidence and did not find that race was being used mechanically. And when we think about the greater good of what it brings to a university, it's not that the educational benefits of diversity are solely for black students. Does it help reduce racial isolation in the classroom? Yes, it, it does, you know, but it also helps develop cross-racial relationships, cross-racial understandings. And I want to push back a little bit about this notion that suggests that by um, considering someone's race, you're assuming that they have certain viewpoints and characteristics. Actually, the whole premise of Justice O'Connor's opinion in the Gruder case on uh, in, in supporting the limited consideration of race, because it is limited, right? And it's only one thing that universities need to be doing to ensure racial equity and access at their universities. But what she understood and what she articulated in that opinion was that the greater numbers of highly qualified students of color that you have, for example, you know, Latinx students, the more Latinx students, it actually allows you to have a greater number of viewpoints so that those people are not speaking as the spokesperson for their race in the classroom. So by shrinking the numbers or, or some, pretending that you know, race does not exist, you actually imperil the incredible benefits that 
can be produced through a robust exchange of ideas based on you know, various viewpoints, which is foundational to our democracy, right? Access and opportunity, when those are impaired, you impair what happens in the classrooms. When you impair what happens in the classrooms, you impair what happens in the workforce in our greater citizenry. Brown v. Board you know, recognized that, Grutter recognized that, and the court has repeatedly recognized that. Now, we haven't always seen it taken, you know, by the by the horn, so to speak, you know, by uh, universities, but they have tried to do it. They need to do, you know, more. But it's important, you know, for folks to understand that these educational benefits of diversity go to everyone uh, in the schools. You know, when we talk about zero sum games, this zero sum game, you know, the university is only going to be as good as the sum of its parts, and the major parts in a university are the students. And I just think that it's incredibly important, you know, for uh, folks to understand, you know, how race as it's considered today is not the same that it was considered yesterday. It's not, you know, in a mechanical way and that there are, you know, tremendous benefits for all students. So I want to get to um, Q&A, uh, but I want to make sure because you didn't make opening statements. Is there anything, don't feel compelled because you may have, I'm hoping that in our discourse, you made the points that you want to make or burning to make. Is anybody burning to say anything before we go to Q&A um, that you came to say and that you haven't said? Uh, if if uh, there is anything, uh, keep it really short uh, and and blame me for mismanagement, so, yeah. I just wanna say one sentence. I think, you know, a strategic use of race, and in this case, we're talking about undergraduate admissions, um, really reflects our contemporary wrestling with the history of race in this country. Um, and again, I don't have a legal mind, so I'm not reading it um, through the prisms that most of you on this call and maybe in the audience are reading it. But I, you know, I really feel that we've inherited what we've inherited, and it's really upon us to kind of, um, you know, to really work with that. So to pretend that, oh, well, let's just not use race because that, you know, that really isn't important. That's sort of saying, oh, let's really not read the history of the United States and the history of imperialism and the history of, except I can go on and on, um, but I think you all get my drift. I, I you know, I, I think the history is there. And so the strategic, the strategic use of race um, is a reflection of that history and that we're trying to wrestle with it. We're trying to deal with it. Got it. Um, got it. Um, uh, Patrick, anything that you need to say that you haven't said already? Well, why don't we preserve maximum time for the questions? I, I, could, okay. I could go on for the rest of the time, and I'm not going to subject everyone to that. I'd rather the students answer questions. Appreciate that. Um, uh, David, you? All right. Well, why don't we turn to uh, the questions and, and, uh, and um, have some Q&A? Sure. So I've been deputized to read some questions out and to curate the questions from the, there's a great Q&A thread and there were some questions uh, uh, collected beforehand. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Dan Farbman. I, I teach at BC Law. I teach con law and various other things. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Gilbert Carrasco in the Q&A uh, and, and, and I'll just read it out. Uh, he says, I was very pleased that Justice Jackson raised the history of race conscious legislation at the time, at the, time the 14th Amendment was adopted. An argument I made in, my, in an amicus brief in Grutter. What do the panelists have to say about originalism as an operative framework in the affirmative action cases before the court? You want me to go first? Sure. Uh, again, I'm going to be very brief here. Uh, I don't think that originalism uh, changes the result in this case. The cases were not initially argued on an originalist basis because Grutter itself is the, is the, the question is whether or not to overrule Grutter. Grutter itself does not rely on originalist theory. So if you believe that originalism is the right answer, I think you have to start before Grutter. But we actually do think that the original understanding supports the view that outside of the immediate remedial context, as in remedial uh, action taken in the wake of uh, intentional discrimination, 
um, uh, race-based uh, uh, decision-making is, uh, is inconsistent with the original understanding of what the 14th Amendment was intended to offer. Uh, the best source for that, I cited it during the Supreme Court argument, is the brief the United States government uh, filed in, its re in the rehearing question on Brown. Uh, it's about 185 pages long. It's, it's stocked with hundreds and hundreds of citations. I think it does the best job of capturing uh, what the view was as to whether the Equal Protection Clause actually prohibited beneficial race-based decision-making, and our view is it does not. David? Yeah, one, I, mean, I think, you know, the uh, Supreme Court's affinity for originalism, you know, as an excuse to try and maintain, you know, certain systemic inequities and inequalities uh, through its interpretations is way out of hand, you know, but that being said, we do know that it is an issue, and it was you know, raised in part through SFFA's briefing suggesting that the Equal Protection Clause was colorblind. You know, it's remarkable uh, when you look at the language itself and they look, note the history uh, around the 14th Amendment, and they had rejected precisely the kind of language that they are now advocating for because there was language out there that suggested a completely colorblind approach to it, uh, but it also, you know, ignores the events surrounding the uh, 19, uh, 1868 ratification of the Equal Protection Clause, and that being mainly, you know, slavery and its um, terrible uh, impacts, you know, that were still ongoing, you know, not just at the federal level, but at uh, the state level. And so we did lead our brief uh, reluctantly, but necessary, we felt, with the first argument addressing originalism uh, and how the um, Equal Protection Clause, you know, when it was uh, being founded, uh, did intend to allow for the consideration of race in very limited circumstances and, uh, you know, to ensure, you know, that uh, black people were no longer uh, being subjugated. So it's certainly, you know, that's part of it, but it was also to ensure that they were able to integrate into greater society uh, as well. And there's a, a number of different briefs that, you know, support this argument by constitutional uh, scholars, by the Constitutional Accountability Center, as well as our brief. And there's an extensive briefing, you know, on this issue, but we felt that it was necessary because they were suggesting that, you know, the colorblind, the, the equal protection clause itself was colorblind. So um, uh, just very quickly, uh, the argument uh, with respect to the original intent of the 14th Amendment um, uh, was taken on, there was a an amicus brief filed in Baki in 77, 78. Uh, uh, which made all these arguments about the 39th Congress and that the 39th Congress uh, enacted a range of race conscious measures, the Freedmen's Bureaus, hospitals, um, uh, you know, schools uh, explicitly for um, uh, black folks coming out of, of, uh, of slavery. So how could that same 39th Congress that adopted the 14th Amendment uh, think that any and all race conscious measures um, uh, are uh, uh, are unconstitutional. Um, uh, so that argument has been made, it's been repeated. The court ignored it in Baki, the court ignored it when the Legal Defense Fund filed an amicus brief in the Gruda case. Only now um, has the court uh, been forced to grapple with that argument, although I hope it doesn't again, ignore it. Um, uh, there's a lot of history there that, um, uh, that uh, uh, of these arguments being made, and I think there's been problematic uh, 14th Amendment jurisprudence in ignoring it. Uh, you have uh, the next question. I should have learned by now that sometimes you mute yourself and you forget to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is another question, uh, uh, sort of a combination of two questions from the Q&A uh, from uh, Mary Holper, my colleague Mary Holper. 
Um, and the question is really about uh, how do you implement, so if this is sort of looking past uh, the event horizon, imagining that the, 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 the affirmative action is struck down and you wanna think about uh, socioeconomic stat using socioeconomic status as a replacement. And the question is, how do you implement that when you have a problem, which is the uh, school's finances needing to uh, uh, admit people who can pay? Um, and you know you have a sort of a rich rich institutions will be will be able to um, uh, admit people uh, in a need blind way, but not all institutions are situated that way. So how will that affect institutions that 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 have a that have certain kinds of necessities to make sure that they're admitting people who can pay? Um, and then related to that, Mary also asks. Um, is the Texas 10% plan, I guess now the 6% plan, um, uh, is that a viable alternative in that, in the sort of, in a post affirmative action world or, or are there problems with that as well? David, do you wanna go first and then I'll respond this time? Sure, on, on, on the issue of cost, um, you know, one, I wanna make sure, you know, I'm not suggesting that the university uh, any university should not, you know, consider socioeconomic status. But my argument is that it shouldn't be replaced. So it's an and, not an or. Um, but uh, it, it it is a real consideration because especially states like North Carolina have not invested, you know, fully in their um, in their higher education system. And you know, the record shows that UNC's done a number of issues and uh, has done a number of programs, I should say, that have benefited uh, socioeconomic, uh, lower socioeconomic status students. And they have increased those numbers uh, over the years. They've offered you know, scholarships to do different recruitment programs. Many of our students actually volunteered or participated in some of those programs as students and then as uh, alumni, so you know there there are those types of programs being engaged. But at the end of the day, there there is a potential you know money factor that the university has to consider because of the lack of investment by the state in that institution. Um, on the second issue about the percentage plan and whether or not you know that would suffice. First, what that actually does is narrow the potential diversity at a university. Right now, the University of North Carolina, for example, considers over 40 characteristics uh, when, when considering a student, right? From extracurricular activities to academic scores, et cetera, right? But it's not focused just on grade points. The Texas plan, which I'm very familiar with because I'm from Texas and uh, participated in the Fisher litigation, uh, it, it, it's, it's a good plan there, but it's based on segregation and it only looks at grade point averages and a basic curriculum that's required. So would you want a university, a state flagship that's supposed to be open to all students uh, to have to narrow the characteristics, the, the uh, qualifications that it might consider all the way down to a blunt instrument like grade point averages. So students who were maybe late bloomers, you know, and started doing really well in their junior or senior year or had some social events come across, you can't even consider those because all you're doing is looking at grade point averages. So even military veterans, UNC has a, a, a you know, considers veteran status. Well, if you're a veteran, but you didn't get in the top 10%, you don't get in to the University of North Carolina. And then finally, I'll, I'll say that there were models run on percentage plans at UNC and the court found that none of them would serve as an adequate replacement for the consideration of race. Um, all right, taking up the last point first, uh, UNC itself ran a percentage plan model back during the Grutter litigation and disclosed the fact that under their, under their, their uh, percentage plan facsimile that they put together, it would actually increase the overall number of underrepresented minority students and decrease the number of white students on campus, but that was unacceptable to UNC because it would also lead to a drop in the average SAT score uh, at the school. And I'll note that UNC has since abandoned the SAT as a requirement and disclaimed 
a desire to use or to maximize the SAT score in its class. So um, I do think percentage plans are acceptable for some universities. Obviously, universities that draw from a national set are not going to be able to use uh, a percentage plan in the same way that Texas does. I'll note also that Texas has always left open some of its slots to holistic consideration. It has never been strictly a percentage plan. And so percentage plans do prevent away, and they prevent away. I mean, the main criticism of percentage plans is that they rely on segregated housing, and we're talking about uh, de facto segregation, not de jure segregation in this case. But if the desire of using race or the desire of achieving racial diversity is in part motivated by a desire to make up for the sins in the, of the history of the American past, you think it would be an attractive feature of these plans that they tend to coalesce around communities that experience some sort of level of de facto segregation today. Um, in reality, I think what you see, and I'll transition to the point about, about the affordability of an SES preference, is that uh, elite colleges like Harvard in this case actually seek to have their cake and eat it too. 75% of the African American uh, admits to Harvard uh, College uh, uh, do not meet Harvard's very generous definition of disadvantage. In Harvard, you're disadvantaged if your family makes less than $105,000 a year. So the vast majority of African Americans admitted to Harvard uh, come from one of the top percentages of income in our country, which is just a way to say that race is being used for the sake of race and not as a proxy for socioeconomic status uh, at Harvard today. Harvard, of course, has an endowment that's the size of, of many second world and perhaps even a couple of first world countries. It is never raised as a defense in its case that it could not afford to increase socioeconomic status. And even Carolina uh, has a number of programs such as uh, community college partnerships uh, and some other socioeconomic benefits that they tout uh, and that they could divert additional resources to. The view in our case is that they need to explore those alternatives before they uh, resort to the use of race. Uh, can we get one more question in? Sure. So I'll give uh, my colleague Frank Garcia the last word uh, or the last question. Um, his question is, if we accept that structural uh, slash historic injustices have, have even some impact on current skills and opportunities in various communities, then how can we ignore diversity in every selection process and hope to achieve more just outcomes? Isn't diversity blind selection really just selection that is blind to the ongoing effects of historic and current injustices? I'll briefly respond and then I'll let David or uh, or uh, Marjorie have the last word. Um, I, I assume the diversity in that sense is being used with respect to racial diversity. Because of course, a socioeconomic preference could very well take into account what someone's current experience is and whether they are suffering from some sort of legacy of discrimination or improper uh, treatment in the past. But of course, that's not what the current preferences operate. They consider race apart from socioeconomic diversity as a separate characteristic. And therefore, it isn't particularly correlated with the people who are still suffering those effects. It often operates to the benefit of the children of recent immigrants or of wealthy members of the preferred racial groups. It also isn't operating in most of these schools to the benefit of Asian Americans, many of whom have suffered similar discrimination, maybe not identical discrimination, but there was a Chinese Exclusion Act. There was the experience of Korematsu. Uh, Asian Americans have faced discrimination. And uh, nonetheless, Harvard has taken to in its use of race, denigrating their personal qualities as part of its analysis. So I would suggest that you can seek to remediate past injustices, and you can seek to help the people who are still suffering from legacies of this country's discrimination without actually making their skin color a criteria in admission. I wasn't sure if Marjorie is gonna weigh in yet, but um, so, so briefly, the, uh, the notion that you should only let, you know, for example, you should only let, you know, black people who have suffered from structural or historic injustices as though you can parse out those people and say, oh, well, here's someone who has suffered and here's someone who has not, you know, because they're one generation perhaps removed from, you know, those injustices is just a, a far reaching notion that, you know, I don't think, you know, finds support in the Social sciences certainly not, but secondly, the um, it's incredibly important that 
universities do consider diversity within diversity, right? So we have testimony from students who talked about how, you know, they were Hispanic and, you know, some of them were the children of Mexican immigrants, but they, you know, um, had associated with, you know, Cuban Americans, uh, for example. And they had very different experiences and they learned from one another. And so there's very, that that richness in diversity within diversity is incredibly important, you know, to uh, universities. Do universities need to do a better job, uh, including UNC and uh, Harvard of recruiting students from underserved uh, communities and especially students of color from underserved communities? Absolutely. Uh, and I think the record shows that they are trying to do that. You know, they don't have to have a perfect admissions program. No one really does. But the last point that I want to make is that Asian Americans actually do benefit from the consideration of race in their applications. We had two Asian American students and alumni testify, one from Southeast Asia and another from um, East Asia, uh, you know, descendant. And they both testified about writing about their own racialized uh, experiences and about how Harvard had noted favorably many of the uh, attributes you know that they had reflected in their narratives. So to suggest that you know actually you know eliminating the consideration of race and if you go as far as SFFA wants to go, which is to censor race, you would actually be severely impacting, you know, Black students, Latinx students, also Asian American students, Native American students. I mean, it's across the board, even white students in the certain circumstances where they might be able to, to raise that. And lastly, I do want to note that there were over 200 Asian American groups who filed amicus, who joined amicus briefs in support of UNC and Harvard in these cases. So there's diversity there too. Um, I know we're just about out of time at two minutes. And um, Margie, if you have a quick point you want to make, uh, go ahead. Uh, I have one quick point that's literally a sentence, but uh, turn it over to you, Margie. I think I just want to thank um, my co-panelists, um, you as moderator. Um, it's it's been a very instructive um, instructive hour and fifteen minutes. I have office hours soon, so I am gonna going to get off. Um, I think um, what uh, uh, Mr. Hinojosa just said, I think mirrors a, um, a lot of my thinking. Um, but I would like to end with a poem. It's not I I picked a short poem. I had a much longer one, if that's okay. Well, it depends on how long it is because we're just about out. Of time. It's really. Um, okay, well, maybe I, I won't read it then. But um, I thank you all. I'm happy to I'm happy to to have been invited and and happy to have um, contributed to this discussion. Thank well, you. thank all the panelists. If you're like me, um, you've been biting your tongue to some degree, even if you've said quite a bit. I just want to say that the problem in this country with race has never been race consciousness. It's been racism. They are not the same thing. Um, so, uh, I think Amen. we are out of time. Yeah. Thank you all.